As we've seen, flavour is very different from taste. Whatever we eat, we only taste sweetness, sourness, saltiness, bitterness and umami, which is related to monosodium glutamate, MSG, and occurs in things like tomatoes and seaweed. These five basic tastes are all perceived through receptors on the tongue, our taste buds. Most of the rest of what's vital to flavour comes through receptors in the nose, via the aroma. We've also seen flavour molecules released from food as we cook it. But what exactly are those flavour molecules doing when we perceive flavour? Leatherhead Food Research Association is funded by the food industry. They do all kinds of food testing here and they have a panel of expert tasters. There's a scientist here that's been working and experimenting on food for the last 20 years. And it's a relationship between chefs like me and scientists like him that will help us get to the bottom of why our food tastes as it does. This test is based on experiments devised by Dr. David Kilcast, the chemist who's head of the Sensory and Consumer Services Division here. In the booths, three professional tasters. Blindfold, they'll be fed samples of vegetable puree they have to identify, trying each one with and without the nose. David calibrates the results as we go. As they eat, small flavour molecules are released in the tasters' mouths. Very light and volatile, some fly up out of the food and are carried by the air up to the back of the nose. Flying up the nose, the molecules send electrical signals to the brain, which then tells the tasters they're experiencing aroma. Together with taste signals from mouth to brain, that gives them the flavour by which they normally identify a food. So can these professional tasters tell what they're eating when they're blindfolded, but use both taste and aroma molecules to perceive flavour? Pureed parsnips. It's very fine puree, parsnip. It's parsnip. Apple? Apple puree. I think that is stewed apple. That doesn't present too many problems, but what if they clamp off the nose and take those aroma molecules yeah. out of the equation? Number six, nose clip on. There you go. That's it. I then gave them broccoli with the aroma molecules blocked off. I would guess it's something like avocado. It's got a very dense texture. It's so difficult, but all you could do is taste. Mashed turnip. It's pea or cabbage or broccoli. I can't taste anything. Next, sweet corn. Again, no aroma molecules involved. I think it's apple. Okay. I can't taste it at all. Apricotty banana. So without the aroma molecules, even the most expert tasters can get things completely wrong. Jane South couldn't tell if broccoli was pea, cabbage or broccoli. The smell is very obviously broccoli, but because we weren't allowed to do that, I had no idea. I was very, very surprised. Number one. And she was quite sure that sweet corn was banana. The texture is just like banana. It is, because without being able to see it or smell it, the texture's like banana. Isn't that amazing? I, I, <laughs> I am really amazed. Okay, and there you go. The this all goes to show that whatever you're eating and whoever you are, aroma molecules in the nose are vital to flavour perception. We've had a look at the chemistry of flavour, and in particular those valuable small molecules that can make our food taste so fantastic. So how do we adapt this to the kitchen? Well, I'm going to show you how to cook asparagus. Traditionally, you're always told to blanch asparagus, which basically means cook it in boiling salted water until done, drain it, and then serve it. The asparagus, by doing that, leaks a lot of the flavour into the water, the heat bursting the cell walls, and those small molecules that are so valuable disappearing. So what I'm going to do is actually cook it in fat. I'm going to use a mixture of butter and oil and cook it in one of these cocotte dishes. Just to show you, at the same time, I'm going to cook some asparagus in boiling water, the traditional way. So one lot of asparagus goes into water to be blanched. 
The other lot's cooked in butter and olive oil. I then grate in some truffle. Shame you can't smell this, because it is unbelievable. Asparagus isn't the only vegetable that benefits being cooked in this manner. Carrots and courgettes work fantastically this way, far superior than just being cooked in boiling water. The most important flavour molecules in asparagus are very soluble in water. The flavour molecules leak into the water, so cook them in oil. Whereas, vegetables like broccoli and green beans are the opposite. The important flavour molecules are soluble in oil and escape if you cook them in fat, so cook these in water. Now they've cooked for 10 minutes, let's take a look. The water the asparagus has blanched in the traditional way has turned green. It tastes of asparagus, but it'll go to waste because what many people now do is they pour the liquid down the sink. A complete waste of all of that flavour. With the one cooked in oil and served with sliced mushroom and chervil, most of the flavour is still intact. So now to the important part, the flavour. This is the asparagus that's been cooked in the boiling water. It's very watery, very soft. There's a, there's a mild asparagus flavour there, but it really is quite insipid. Now to the one that's been cooked in the butter and oil in the covered pot. It's completely different. The texture's more dense. It's got a wonderful earthiness to it, but the asparagus flavour is still prominent. Using oil, we've got the flavour molecules to work with us, not against us. Full of flavour and easy to make at home. Many vegetables don't have bright colours and have little flavour until they're cooked. But many fruits have bright colours and lots of natural flavour. Why? To survive as a species, they want to spread their seed around, so they attract birds, animals and humans to eat them. Technically, tomatoes are fruit. Once it's ripe, it's brightly coloured, so we can see it. And once it's opened, the flavour's let loose. Inside the tomato, enzymes catalysts that provoke chemical reactions. Once the tomato's cut, the enzymes can move about inside, snipping up those long molecular chains. All this happens very fast. Once we bite it, the enzymes inside the tomato go crazy. The heat and moisture of our saliva speeds up all those chemical reactions and the big molecules explode at an incredible speed. Liberated, the flavour molecules fly off, creating taste and aroma, and we get a sudden hit of tomato. As with many fruits, the colour attracts the animal. The flavour makes us all want to come back and eat it again and again. But most vegetables need cooking to maximise flavour, like cauliflower. And now for something special, cauliflower risotto. Once you begin to understand the basics of the science of cooking and the psychology of flavour, even the most mundane, unromantic vegetables like cauliflower begin to reveal their potential. In this dish, I brought together several different ways of preparing cauliflower. Cauliflower broth, cauliflower risotto, cauliflower cream, some very thin raw cauliflower, some caramelised cauliflower, and some dry cauliflower. Now, one of my chefs, David, is going to show us how to prepare it. To make the stock, first warm some butter. Add one part finely sliced onion to three parts finely sliced cauliflower and sweat until soft. It should stay white and not caramelise. Cover it with cold water, bring to the boil and leave to simmer for 20 minutes. Refresh it with some finely sliced cauliflower and cauliflower leaves. Different textures, more flavour. Then rest it off the stove for a further 20 minutes before sieving. Meanwhile, the cauliflower cream. Heat some butter till it's burnt noisette. That's foamy, with a nutty brown colour and flavour. Add raw cauliflower florets. Keep stirring for 10 to 15 minutes till soft and caramelised, before pureeing in a blender with milk and butter. Now the cauliflower discs. Take a root of cauliflower and cut it so it's almost barrel shaped. Then slice this on a mandolin. 
cut into round discs. Then take a sheet of cling film and place one disc in the centre. Arrange five to six discs overlapping to form a circle. Now the dry cauliflower. Take a small florette and slice this finely on the mandolin. Spread the slices on a baking tray and dry them out at 60 Celsius. Finally the risotto. Bring a little of the stock to the boil and add a portion of the risotto base. When almost completely reduced, add a second ladle of stock. Keep stirring. Keep adding ladles of stock and reducing till the rice is cooked. To finish, keep beating vigorously while you add some cauliflower cream, some mascarpone cheese, grated parmesan, chives and butter. Leave to rest for a few minutes to enhance the texture. More textures, more flavour. And to serve. First the risotto, then the discs using a cutter to give that dome-like effect. And four cocoa jellies on top. The cauliflower cream foamed up in the blender. Dried cauliflower on top of the jellies. And finally, a dusting of cocoa powder. And that's it, cauliflower risotto. Thanks to all those textures, cauliflowers you've never had it before.